So our talk tonight is on um, the problem of evil. Why does God permit evil? And so we've seen in the previous talks that um, God creates, in our first talk, we saw that God creates so as to freely communicate goodness outside of himself. And since he's infinite goodness, he wills to communicate goodness as much as possible. Um, and thus to maximize the goodness communicated. Um, God wills to create a, a universe in which goodness is um, maximized. But an, what that means is that we've seen in earlier talks to maximize goodness means to create a world in which there are all the levels of goodness. So it's strange because we would think, ah, to maximize goodness, just create the top level. Just, just perfect beings. But no, to maximize goodness is to create a world in which there are all the levels. And because that includes a greater participation of God, not just one level, but all of them. And we made, gave the analogy of the symphony. Symphony is more beautiful if it has all the instruments and not just the first violin. Um, the zoo is more beautiful because it got all the animals and not just the, whatever you like, the eagle or the lion. Um, and this maximizing of goodness um, has various consequences. And in the past two talks, we looked at two of those consequences. One consequence of, of the fact that he wants to create all the different levels of good is that creation is hierarchical. And if there are all those levels of good, well, the, the levels will be different. And thus, there's inequality in the universe. And that's a good thing. Right? It's a really good thing. Because it makes possible precisely the maximizing of all the, all the different levels of good and not just the top level, say, angels. And right? so um, an unequal universe is better than an equal one. Even though... That seems strange to us with our egalitarian society. But um, that would be like a symphony with equal, all first violins, just first violins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Choir with just sopranos. I there might be a place for that, but um, that, uh, that shouldn't be the, uh, that, that would restrict the good communicator. And then we saw another consequence of this principle that God m wants to create all the different levels. Another beautiful consequence is complementarity. And no one creature can fully mirror God. And so the world is better that many different creatures mirror different aspects, different and even opposing complementary aspects of God's goodness. And we saw that was um, present in gender differentiation that even in within the human species and um, male gender and female gender are complementary um, in such a way that that difference enriches humanity um, and again um, that's politically incorrect um, um, we, today we're given the impression that it would be better if, if everyone were the same but that would take away this beauty of complementarity um, tonight we'll look at another, even more paradoxical consequence of the maximization of good, and that it's precisely a world that has all the levels of good that makes possible evil. And so a world in which evil exists is a consequence precisely of God willing to make all the levels of good. And what does that mean? That means some levels, like angels, that can't and perish that are indestructible physically uh, they can't lose their being they can uh, make it bad like the fallen angels um, and then other beings material beings that can lose their being altogether but that's a, a good level of being still but it's a lower level being and it it's a level of being in which the good that's received is possessed for a time and then it's lost to make way for other good beings. 
And that whole order of things is good. But what does it mean? It means that there'll be physical evil in which the beings that have this temporary being enjoy it and lose it. And others come and enjoy it and lose it, etc. Um, and that's good. Right? But nevertheless, for the person dying, the, um, that's not good. But for the order of the whole, it's very good. We'll, we'll nail in, we'll um, narrow in on these ideas as we go along. And so in creating all the levels of goodness, um, God permits there to be evil, which is the falling away from the good that's intended by God. And we'll follow in this talk um, St. Thomas Aquinas' treatment of it in the Summa Theology. Um, in his treatise on creation, uh, which is um, a masterpiece. And he deals with the problem of evil in um, the first part of the Summa, questions 48 and 49. Um, so first question, what are we talking about? Um, what is evil? And some um, thinkers, some even religions, have supposed evil to be a kind of being. Um, and when... What, when people think like that, what they usually mean is matter is the principle of evil. Um, and this would be a kind of dualism. The ancient Gnostics and Manichees held this view that the principle of evil is simply matter and that um, to be in matter is evil and the goal is to escape from it. And you find this idea in Eastern thought as well. Um, But um, evil, we'll see, isn't a kind of being, but rather the lack of being that ought to be. In the first talk, when we were looking at why does God create, we saw that everything that he made is good and that everything that he made is like him in some way. But there are all these different levels of being like him. The higher levels are more like him. The lower levels are less like him. But all are like him and thus all are good in their own way. Right? So that shows us that everything that is, insofar as it is, is good. And we can see this simply in the fact that everything that is, and we see it especially in living things, has a natural desire, a natural inclination to conserve its being, to, un to develop its being, to grow, and to communicate its being by re reproduction. And that implies that being is good to hold on to, to develop, and to spread. And so being itself is good. But when we look at what's evil and think about it, what we'll see is that evil is the lack of the being that ought to be there. So, for example, if I injure myself and lose an arm, that evil, that physical evil of um, is the lack of the arm that ought to be there. Blindness, the lack of the sight that ought to be there. And we'll say moral evil is the lack of love that ought to be in the, the human act. And we'll come back to that. All right, so evil is the failing um, of a creature to be what it ought to be. St. Thomas defines evil as um, the privation of a perfection that's due. And privation means not simply the, um, the not having, but not having something that ought to be. And so the fact that um, we're, we can't uh, uh, fly like an eagle isn't a privation because we're not eagles. But if we were blind, blindness would be a privation because it's natural for human beings to see. All right, so evil is the privation of a perfection that's due. Or in the Summa Theology defines it as the absence of a good which is natural and due to a thing. Right, that's what evil is. So if I ought to have something in virtue of my nature, two arms, if I lose one, that would be a physical evil. If something ought to be in my act, my free act, like um, 
reason and love, and that's lacking, that would be a moral evil. And so it's the lack of what ought to be there by the nature of what it is. I'm not, it's, so evil isn't simply lacking, isn't simply the absence of something. Yeah. Right? It's not evil to us, St. Thomas gives the example, that we can't run like the deer or that we don't have the strength of a lion. Yeah. But if we didn't act rationally, then that would be evil for us if we acted contrary to conscience. Right? So evil isn't simply not being, but it's the not being of what ought to be according to nature. And you can see from this that evil can only be in something good. Because it would only be evil if it's the lack of what ought to be there according to nature and every nature is good. So evil can only be in a subject that's good. Because evil is the lack of something that that good subject ought to have in virtue of his good nature. Right? Like sight. Like two arms. Like reason and charity in a free human act. And so the lack of sight in a blind man is a, an evil in someone whose nature is very good. And the lack of goodwill in a sinner is still a, a privation, an evil, in one whose humanity is very good. Right? And that's precisely what makes that, and so here the law is, the, the greater the good in which that lack exists, the greater the evil. In other words, an evil is greater precisely when it's in a higher nature. And so evil in an angel, Satan, is far worse than evil in merely a human being. And obviously evil in a human being is immensely, immeasurably worse than physical evil in a chimp or a gorilla or anything else. Um, so that because evil takes its, um, what should we call it, its evilness from the goodness of the subject in which the evil lies. And there's a, um, um, a motto, a, um, a, a saying that the corruption of the best is the worst. Corruptio optimi pessim. Um, or Shakespeare says something similar. Um, Roses that fester smell far worse than weeds. Now, since evil is essentially the lack of a good that ought to be there, it follows we can only recognize evil and, and know it by knowing the good that ought to be there. In other words, we can only recognize evil through knowing the good. We can only know evil indirectly by knowing the good that ought to be there and is lacking. Right? And, and we can um, only recognize the gravity of, the, of an evil by recognizing the value of the good that's lacking and ought to be there. And so this is very important. It means that we don't come to know evil directly, but we know evil through good. That's what we know directly. And that's what we understand. And there, there are a lot of consequences of this. Take even a doctor. A doctor can know um, sickness because he knows health. Right? You have to first understand the health that ought to be there before you can understand the sickness that's taking away that health. And the same thing goes in the spiritual life. In order to understand... Um, Sin, or um, even something, say, on the psychological or psychological disorders, you have to understand um, health and spiritual health. Um, 
Pope Francis refers to this in his recent document, um, The Joy of the Gospel. He emphasizes, um, and not just there, but in many of his, um, his homilies, he emphasizes that um, in presenting the faith, in evangelization, the key thing is presenting the positive. Right? We have to present Christ and, um, and the whole gospel. And it's only in the light of the positive vision that we can understand sin and also the, the moral norms that protect um, the dignity of the human person. And so that means that in, in presenting the gospel, um, we can't, you can't start with the negative. Right? You can't start with the thou shalt not, because the thou shalt not only makes sense with respect to the, the good. So, for example, thou shalt not kill only makes sense when you see the, the dignity of the human person made in the image of God for whom Christ shed all his blood. And so Pope Francis writes, as for the moral component of catechesis, which promotes growth and fidelity to the gospel way of life, it's helpful to stress again and again the attractiveness and the ideal of a life of wisdom. In other words, presenting the positive. Um, in the light of that positive message, a rejection of the evils which endanger that life can be better understood. And so rather than as experts in dire predictions, dour judges bent on rooting out every threat and deviation, we should appear as joyful messengers of challenging proposals, guardians of the goodness and beauty which shine forth in a life of fidelity to the gospel. Now, it's by presenting the positive ideal that that's what attracts and that's what makes sense out of the moral norms and the, um, uh, the, the thou shalt not. Another consequence of this is that sin, since um, we only recognize evil through the good, it follows that sin is, is by its very nature, mysterious, and in, but mysterious not with a fullness of being like God has, but mysterious exactly in the opposite way with an, um, a lack of being and therefore a lack of intelligibility. Sin is simply unintelligible, ultimately. Um, and when we try and understand it, what we're understanding is only what's rational in it. In other words, the, because in every sin, there's some aspect of good. The person in sinning is seeking some good. And um, it's only that that makes intelligible what they've done or what, what we've done. And so um, sin is essentially dark. No? And that's why scripture speaks of sin using the metaphor of darkness and um, and virtue with the metaphor of light. And this, too, is why we'll see later on why God is not the cause of sin, because sin is a lack of being. And we're we who are from nothing. We're capable all by ourselves without any help uh, to do a kind of nothing, which is sin. Right? Sin being the lack of the right order that ought to be there. It's true, sometimes Satan may help us, but we really don't need any help in that. All right, so why is there evil in things? St. Thomas asks this question. Now, we, and he actually he asks a simpler question. He asks, is there evil in things? And we might say that's a really stupid question. Um, but he asks this question to explain really why, why um, it is that there's evil. And he says, he answers, the perfection of the universe requires that there should be inequality in things. So we've said that in the last two talks that makes possible all the different levels of good. So the perfection of the universe requires that there should be inequality in things so that every grade of good may be realized. Right? That's our key principle. Now, one grade of good is that of the good that can't fail, say, an angelic nature. The angel can't lose its being. But another grade of goodness is that of the good which can fail in goodness. And that would be all material beings lose their goodness. And both grades are found to exist. Right? The spiritual creation and the material creation. 
There are some things that cannot lose their existence as incorruptible things, while other things which can lose it as corruptible things, material things. And therefore, as therefore the perfection of the universe requires there should be not only the incorruptible, but also the corruptible beings. So the perfect and we saw that before with the complement, the complementarity of spirit and matter. So, too, the perfection of the universe requires there should be some things that can fail in goodness. And it follows that sometimes they do fail and pretty frequently when we get to the end of our lifetime. At least with regard to our body, but our our soul belongs to the spiritual universe. And so it doesn't lose its being, but continues. Right? Man's this odd crossroads in which a part of us belongs to material creation that has a perishable goodness. And part of us belongs to the spiritual creation, which naturally continues. Now, of course, God will raise up the material as well in the last day, but that's not natural. And so um, it's part of the order, or we could say the maximization of good, that there be a universe in which there's physical evil, in which things are made that can fail and do fail. The dog dies. But even though the corruption of a thing, the death of an animal, is an evil for that animal, and also for us who maybe um, love it, um, its existence as a corruptible being is good. Right? That's the key point. Because that existence on that level is part of the perfection of the universe. And so it's good in itself, and it's good for the sake of the order of the whole. Now, one of the sources that St. Thomas uses in, in the problem of evil, or we could say um, all Catholic reflection on the problem of evil, is St. Augustine in his Confessions. Um, St. Augustine, for um, something like 10 years, had fallen into the sect of the Manichees. And the Manichees held um, the idea that I mentioned before, um, that evil, the cause of evil is simply matter. That matter is the principle of evil. And by the very fact that we're, um, we have these bodies that our souls are stuck in, um, that's the source of evil. Now, a doctrine like this is convenient, no? Why is it convenient? Because it implies that the source of the evil of my acts is the fact is my body and not my soul. Um, but of course, we all know that um, the source of the evil of free human acts isn't our body, but our free choice. Yeah. But nevertheless, it took Augustine, despite his incredible intelligence, it took him a while to come to this. No, it took him 10 years of wrestling with this problem. And he, he speaks about it in the um, seventh book of the Confessions. Now, this isn't only an old problem, um, the Manichees. No, the, the, that way of thought has had a long life. It was the first heresy, then Gnosticism. It um, revived in the Middle Ages under the form of Albigensianism. And it was actually against the Albigensians that the church first instituted the Inquisition. And um, it was a real threat to Christian society because Manichees see the body as evil and therefore they see marriage as evil because it's the source of new bodies and they see um, procreation as evil and contraception as good and euthanasia as good etc in other words it sounds pretty familiar the culture of death in our time is another form of manichaeism and right? seeing more bodies as bad yeah. And see, another aspect of it would be denying, say, the existence of, um, of sin, free will, and attributing um, evil simply to um, um, physical um, kind of determinism, physical conditions. In any case, shortly before his conversion, St. Augustine came to see that, and this could be right, that corruptible nature can't be an evil in itself, but must be good. Otherwise, it's a really simple reason. 
The reasoning is this. And we see the corruption of, um, of, say, an animal or even the death of a human being to be a, a tragedy. Well, it would only be a tragedy if the life were good. Well, if the life is good, then material being is good. And what's evil is only the loss of that good material being. Right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be tragic. Yeah. It's death or sickness. So he writes this. It was obvious to me that things which are liable to corruption are good. If they were the supreme goods, um, or if they weren't good at all, they couldn't be corrupted. They're goods, but they're intermediate goods. Right? They're lower than, say, the angels, but higher than nothing. Because if they were nothing, if they were not good at all, they couldn't be corrupted. And it wouldn't be tragic when, when they die. Corruption doesn't does harm doesn't harm. Uh, I'm sorry. Corruption does harm. And unless it diminishes the good, no harm would be done. I get this. Um, this comes up in um, frequently in discussions with my in-laws. So I always use them as examples um, because the problem of evil comes up over and over again. Every in fact, every time we have um, dinner with them, just about. And um, and this is. Something very beautiful, because the, the very protest over the problem of evil, the Holocaust, so many other evils, the suffering of a child, that very protest and the strength of the protest, what is it based on? An intuition of the goodness of innocent human life. And the very strength of the indignation is what shows or is based on that natural perception of the great good. And it's precisely that that points to a good God as its author. Now, and that was precisely the insight that St. Augustine had, that he wouldn't have be bothered by the, the death of his friend or, or of any other thing if, if even material beings like human beings or animals weren't good. Therefore, St. Augustine concludes, as long as they exist, they're good. And therefore, whatever things exist are good. And the evil into whose origins I was inquiring isn't a substance, no, like, as he thought, matter. For if it would be a substance, it would be good. Either it would be an incorruptible substance, a great good, like an angel or our souls, or a corruptible substance, which could be corrupted only if it were good. Hence I saw, and it was made clear to me, that you made all things good. And there are absolutely no substances which you did not make. But as you did not make all things equal, all things are good in the sense that taken individually they're good, and all together they're very good. No? And after each day of creation, God says, saw that it was good, but at the end of the sixth day... It's very good, and that could be for two reasons that it's very good. Because man was created then, but also because the whole order was created and completed then. Right? So it's the whole that's very, very good. But in the parts of the universe, there are certain elements which are thought evil. Mosquitoes. Whatever. And because... <laughs> That's silly. Because of a conflict of interest. In other words, what's good for them is bad for me. Better example, cancer, something like that. Um, these elements are congruous with other elements and as such are good, good in themselves, but they may not be good for me. So each thing is good. There's no evil nature. Right? Mosquitoes don't have an evil nature. Um, even cancer doesn't have an evil nature for the cancer but only for us. Yeah. Maybe that's not a good example because the cancer doesn't exist in itself, whereas the mosquito does. But, uh, but in any case, the point remains that everything in itself, insofar as it is, is good. And it, what's bad for the mosquito is when it loses a wing. Yeah. 
And the whole universe needs all the different levels. Even though we don't want all of the different levels in our body. Okay. And let's look now. Why, so why does God permit um, evil? Well, we've just given a, a first answer. For the sake of the common good of the whole universe, so that it'll have all the levels of good. And those are complementary levels. St. Thomas makes the same point when he says, God and nature and any other agent, even the human being, and in our works, make what is best in the whole, but not what is best in every part, except in order to the whole. Let's take an example. In making a, a building, the architect won't make every part of the building equally beautiful. There'll be the bathroom and the pipes underneath. But each thing has its own, what's proper to it for the sake of the beauty of the whole. Right? And so it is in every body. Um, and thus, likewise, in in and the whole of the universe. Every wise um, architect, maker, um, looks at the whole. Just as writing a book, you want to not make um, brilliant sentences, but you have to be concerned about the whole. Um, and so God um, makes everything for the sake of the beauty of the whole, which we call the common good. Right? And it's the same in government. The task of those who govern is the common good of the whole, which is the right order of society. Um, in which all of us find our own proper good. That's what's best for all. And the whole, St. Thomas goes on, which is the universe of creatures, is the better and more perfect if some things in it can fail in goodness and do sometimes fail. God not preventing this, but allowing nature to take its course. For the most part, no, unless he works a miracle, which he doesn't ordinarily do. And this happens, St. Thomas says, first, because it belongs to providence, not to destroy nature, but to save nature. Um, in other words, to allow nature to be nature. And it belongs to nature that what may fail sometimes fails when an animal dies. And secondly, because God is so powerful that he can even make good out of evil. No, and that's the beauty of divine providence. And that's exactly what we don't see um, always here on earth. Um, but which we will see in the last judgment. How he's brought good out of these evils that we don't understand. But we know the principle, right? And it's faith that lives knowing that principle. Right, right, right. We can't understand that. But we know this, that um, that child, um, th when evil done, say to a child, doesn't ultimately harm the child because that child is innocent and um, goes straight to heaven. Evil harms the one who does it. Right? That's the problem with evil, is that evil com um, harms the one who commits evil immeasurably more than the one who receives that evil. And even a pagan philosopher, Plato, understood that. That injustice is immensely um, more uh, harmful to the one who commits injustice than to the one who receives it. And so it's, but yeah, I mean, we, in the individual case, we can't give an answer why God permitted this individual case. We can only give an answer in general. And so here St. Thomas says simply this, that many good things would be taken away if God permitted no evil at all to exist. What would be the first thing that would, well, I mean, we'll see now all the different levels. And he gives some examples. Fire wouldn't be generated if air weren't corrupted. And the life of a lion wouldn't be preserved unless the deer were killed, etc. 
neither would avenging justice, in other words, the, the effort that society makes to establish justice and to root out injustice, that merit and that good of preserving justice um, wouldn't occur if there weren't injustice, nor would the patience of a sufferer be praised if there were no injustice. Um, and we can just simply see this in our life. If, um, if we didn't have any trials, we wouldn't grow at all in, um, in patience, in virtue, in, um, in, any, um, in love. And so if God didn't permit any evils at all to exist, a great spectrum of good would be eliminated from creation. And this shows us something. This shows us that God's intent in creation is not minimizing evil, right, as his principal intention, but his intention is maximizing good. Um, now, he doesn't cause the evil. He merely permits it. Um, but he doesn't allow um, the abuse of freedom to take away um, the right use of it. Again, this is where my father in law always gets upset. He said, Why don't you just come down and zap him before he does the harm? Well, if God did that every single time, if he just zapped um, us when we sinned, um, there wouldn't be anybody in this room. <laughs> there would only be children up to the age of seven. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And that would be the end. So. Uh, how would they have gotten here? Right. So it's a very good thing that God doesn't zap us um, as soon as we, in the very act of sinning. All right. So many goods would be suppressed if God didn't permit any evil. Um, first good that we express the entire material universe. I need to have. Um, if you wanted to avoid physical evil, in other words, the loss of being of some physical thing, um, you'd have to not have any material universe because it's the very nature of physical things. It's there. It, it's what's good about the physical universe is that it can change. But in changing, some things die and other things are born. And so to get rid of physical evil in the material universe would mean no material universe. And in the moral universe, to get rid of evil, what would that mean? To get rid of free choice. But if you got rid of free choice, what else would you get rid of? Every good choice. And thus all merit and all love and any um, act according to conscience and any free act. Um, and so God wisely doesn't do that. In other words, God, um, in, max in wanting to maximize good, even though foreseeing that evil will freely result, um, um, God takes a creation is a risk. Now, I mean, that sounds silly. God, um, from all eternity, foreknows the risk he's taking. But nevertheless, the risk is creating free creatures who can respond to his grace or not. And he doesn't stop doing it because he foresees that many or all of us, except for one, uh, Mary, will, in fact, sin sometimes very gravely. Now, let's just we'll develop this more just a second. Let's distinguish um, two kinds of evil that I presuppose in this talk, physical evil and um, moral evil. So physical evil is the, um, the corruption of, um, of the being of a material being. Right? So physical evil would be um, um, the loss of we said and blindness, the loss of limb, etc., the loss of health, the loss of life in a material being. And that, we said, comes simply from the fact that material being, by its nature, is a temporary being, has a temporary life. Even if you're a mountain, a mountain has a temporary life. Even a star has a certain span of existence. And so it's built into the very good nature of the material universe that one thing evolves into another and in that evolution loses its, the being that it formerly had and is destroyed or corrupted in the process so that something else can come into being. 
Right, so that's physical evil. Right. Moral evil is um, the highest, immensely the highest kind of evil because it's in, um, it's in a spiritual being and in a spiritual operation. Right? Moral evil is a lack. We said all, all evil is a lack. Right? It's the lack of the good that ought to be there. Moral evil is a lack in a free act by a rational creature, human being or angel. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, what, what could be lacking in a free action? Well, an action of a rational being ought to be, first, rational. Right? So an act, the act of a rational being ought to be rightly ordered. And what does that mean? It ought to be rightly ordered to its proper end. And the proper end of um, a, a ra- an act of a rational being ought to be the universal goodness that only a rational being can, can know. The good. And ultimately, God. And so a rational creature ought to be ordering his acts to goodness in general and to God in particular. Um, and thus, our acts ought to be ordered by love of God and love of neighbor made in God's image, who's also ordered to God. And if our acts aren't ordered to that, then something is lacking that ought to be there, right? And that's precisely our definition of evil. The lack of a great good that ought to be present by nature. So in a free human act, there ought to be this order to God, and to charity, and to the law of God, which orders us to be charitable, right? and evil will be, sin, moral evil, will be the lack of that right order that ought to be there. And so we can define sin as an act, um, a thought, or a, a word, um, or an omission contrary to the right order, which is God's law. Right? And so that's moral evil would be a lack. But notice that it's a lack um, in something still very good. A free act is a very good thing because a free act enables us to be a participant with God in um, with God's providence in governing the world. Um, other things just do what their natures move them to do. But through our free acts, we make ourselves collaborators um, with governance, with um, um, collaborators with divine providence. If our acts are good. Right, so God never desires moral evil. And right, he can't do that. But he desires um, that free will exist and that it be very abundant. He wants there to be many, many, many myriads of angels and billions and billions of of, um, of human beings with free will exercising that free will in all the acts of our conscious adult life right? and so those free acts are um, um, the glory of creation because they make possible what God created the whole for which is um, charity right? that we give ourselves back to him freely um, in love for um, him having loved us first Let's look now at another article of St. Thomas where he asks and why God permits evil. And and in particular, he asks, is God the direct cause of evil? And this is from the Summa Theology, part one, question 49, article two. And he and he poses in all of his articles, he poses objections. And so I'm just going to go through this because and kind of summarize our discussion. So our first objection is taken from scripture, it would seem that God is the cause of evil because he says in Isaiah, I am the Lord, there is no other God, forming the light, creating darkness, making peace, creating evil. And Amos says, shall there be evil in a city which the Lord hasn't done? So it seems that God's the cause of evil in scripture. 
Another objection that he makes is that um, God is the first cause of all things. But secondary causes that depend on a first cause, it seems that their effects should be traceable back to the first cause. So if he makes us and we're secondary causes and we sin, well, it seems that he's got the responsibility. The buck stops there, more or less. Um, And the third objection is similar. Um, So um, that's what he's going to respond to at the end. So we're going to come back to those objections. Um, He then cites St. Augustine as his authority that God is not the direct cause of evil. St. Augustine says God is not the author of evil because he's not the cause of things tending to not being, but to being. He's the cause of the being of things. And of their nature, which tends to being. And then he distinguishes, as we have, um, physical evil, moral evil, and a third kind, which is the evil of punishment, which I haven't mentioned. But the evil of punishment, um, or penalty, we could say, um, is in one way an evil and in another way a good. A penalty is good in that it... Um, um, it enacts justice. It restores, in some sense, it, it manifests justice by establishing a penalty for sin. And, but the one undergoing the penalty, obviously that's an evil for them, as in hell, or even purgatory. Or even here on earth, when we um, suffer the consequences of sin, as when we all die, the consequences of original sin. Right? But nevertheless, the penalty is a good because it's um, the establishment of justice. So those are three kinds of evil. And so St. Thomas says, starting with the highest kind, moral evil, um, that evil which consists in the defect of action, that's moral evil. No, moral evil is the defect of action, an action that ought to be governed by charity, reason, and conscience, fails to be governed by them. And so that would be a defect of action. Well, defect of action is caused by a defect in the agent. If we act defectively, it's because there's a defect in us. And we can see that when a person um, sins, their sin is resulting from some kind of disordered attachment to sin, which is allowed by us to overrule conscience's voice. Right? And so if we sin... We're sinning because of a defect in us, which is a bad will, not wanting to follow conscience, and some um, culpable attachment causing that bad will, by which we're preferring some creature to God, as in a mortal sin. So, evil that consists in the defect of action is caused by a defect in the agent in the in the sinner but in god there's no defect hence this evil that consists in defect of action in other words sin is does not have god as its cause in any way but only the creature right so good, take an example god made satan very good stupendously good we think the best of any creature that he created And so God isn't the cause of Satan's evil choice, right? But only Satan. Now, of course, that's rather inexplicable. Why did Satan choose to rebel against God's beautiful order? But we said before, evil is inexplicable because evil can only be understood in the light of good. And in itself, it's irrational and thus um, mysterious not by, um, um, we said, mysterious, by an, a lack of light, a lack of, of being. Um, and the same thing is true for us. Now, in our own sins, God's not in any way the cause, but simply our own, um, our own voluntary defect. Now, there, um, the other two kinds, 
So sin is in no way attributed to God, right? But only to us. But the other two kinds are indirectly due to God. It's true. But for the sake of the good order of the whole. Right? So for the sake of the good order of the whole, God creates material things that are going to die. Yeah. And that they're still good. And when he um, enacts a penalty for sin, say, um, death as a result of original sin, that penalty in itself is good. Because it establishes justice and manifests um, the gravity of sin, right? which that manifesting is itself good. Right? So God, he, he doesn't will death for its own sake. He wills life for its own sake. But the life of a creature that lives, say, 70 years, um, he wills the life for its own sake, but he indirectly wills the death as part of the order of the whole, right? part of the order of the universe. All right, let's look at these objections. So the first objection, um, those um, texts from Scripture, St. Thomas thinks that they refer to the evil of penalty. In other words, when God says there's no evil in the city, um, is there an evil in the city which the Lord hasn't done? Um, the prophet Amos is talking about um, certain penalties that were being inflicted on Israel as a result of sin. Right? And so God, in some sense, is the author of that penalty by being the author of an order of justice. But Israel is the author of that penalty by committing the sin that brought down that penalty. Right? And the same thing happens to each one of us when we sin. And the same thing happened to Adam and Eve in their sin. Okay. The second objection um, is it was more difficult. So the second objection was that um, God is the first cause. It would seem that um, evil produced by a secondary cause should be attributed to the first cause. And so St. Thomas explains the effect. Uh, this is a little difficult here. So he says the the effect of a deficient secondary cause is reduced to the first cause with regard to everything that it has of being and perfection, but not with regard to what it has of defect and failure. And he gives this example of limping. So in somebody who's limping, we don't attribute the limping to nature so much as to um, the defect of, say, um, something's wrong with my bone or with my muscle. Um, and so there's a, the reason for the limping is the defect, but the fact that I can still move at all comes from the goodness of my nature. And so whatever good there is in something defective, sure, it comes from God. But the defect doesn't come from God. So in a sin, there's something still good. There's an action. There's some being. There's some good that's sought, even though it's disordered. And all of that comes ultimately from God. But the defect, the sin, the disorder, doesn't come from him at all. Right. The physical, so there's a physical good there. God's sustaining, but there's a moral evil that he's not the cause of. He's the cause of all the physical good in whatever we do. Right. Sure. That's just a matter of semantics. Right. Right. Yeah. In other words, physical evil. And we don't want to call it evil because that sounds like moral evil. But um, it's the lack of the good being that ought to be there. And so there's a key principle here that God is faithful, even though we are unfaithful. And we'll, we'll come, we'll meet this principle again and again in the following talks when we talk about the covenants, because that's what happens in every covenant. God establishes a covenant and he doesn't, um, he doesn't, uh, he, he foresees that the covenant will be broken, but he doesn't um, 
fail to offer it, and he's faithful to it despite our infidelity in keeping it. So God remains faithful even though we're unfaithful. And this is realized in all different ways. Just take something, an example. If we um, transmit life in a way contrary to God's design, God's still faithful to the natural order and gives that life. Even though it was, whatever, conceived um, in vitro, um, even cloning, um, rape. Um, so God is faithful to the order of nature he has established, even when we are um, terribly unfaithful to it. And thanks be to God that he's faithful, um, even though we're unfaithful, because that gives us um, a chance for repentance. That um, enables us to be, as we said before, so that we don't get zapped the first time we um, sin. Yeah. St. Paul writes this to Timothy. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And that kind of sums it up. Um, he's faithful to his plan. But part of that plan is if we deny him, he denies us. But he remains faithful to the covenant even when we are not. Right? And we'll, we'll explore that in following talks. Or to put it another way, philosophers say, abuse should not take away right use. So the fact that freedom is very frequently abused doesn't lead God to not give it to us. But he gives to us very liberally, very generously, no, and wants it to be more generous and be fruitful and multiply. And then finally, God doesn't neglect to do his part. Right? And so in the sin isn't attributed to God. He gives an analogy with the ship sinking. And um, sure, the captain of a ship or the the um, the one steering um, would be the culpable for the sinking of a ship if he failed to do what he ought to have done. Um, but God doesn't fail to do what he ought to do in governing the universe because he gives us sufficient grace always. And we might um, and we do want him to give more than sufficient grace. We pray. And that's why we pray. Now, we pray so that God give us not only sufficient grace, but super abundant grace and super, super abundant graces and to our neighbor. No, but nevertheless, God always gives sufficient grace to everyone not to sin. And that's why when one sins, they were going against the sufficient aid that God was giving them simply in giving them conscience and in um, making them aware in some way. Of conscience's voice. All right, so sin is never God's fault, um, but God wills to permit it to uphold the order that He's created, which includes free will. This is beautifully summarized in a reading we had the other day in the um, Daily Mass, Ben Sirach chapter 15, um, verses 11 to 20 says, do not say because of the Lord, I left the right way for he will not do um, what he hates. Sin. No, he can never cause sin because he hates sin. Do not say it was he who led me astray for he had no need of a sinful man. The Lord hates all abominations and they are not loved by those who fear him. It was he who created man in the beginning and he left him in the power of his own inclination, his own choice. And this is one of the key texts um, about free will. If you will, God says, you can keep the commandments and to act faithfully is a matter of your own choice. He has placed before you fire and water. Stretch out your hand for whichever you wish before a man are life and death and whichever he chooses will be given to him. He has not commanded anyone to be ungodly and he has not given anyone permission to sin. And so God, in giving us free will, gives us um, also his grace to act, well, his actual grace. And that's given to everyone, um, even though it can be given more. And that's precisely why we pray for our neighbor. 
And then finally, the existence of moral evils. So we said a first answer. Why does God permit moral evil? For the sake of free will, which is a stupendous good. And the second answer is this, that those moral evils accidentally um, create the occasion for still greater goods that would never exist if there weren't moral evils. And since God wants to maximize good, he wills to permit the evil also for this, so that these other goods be realized, which otherwise wouldn't be realized. And we said before, they include things like um, martyrdom, like enduring persecution um, faithfully, and patience in, in the face of difficulty. Right? If no one ever gave us a hard time in any way, there would be no merit in charity and patience, and we wouldn't grow in it. There would be no way to show the strength of our love by sacrifice if there were no need of sacrifice. Yeah. Now we can see it, I mean, even in this St. Augustine's Confessions, the beauty of his conversion um, has something to do with the fact that um, um, he strayed away for so long. And the end of everything should be judged by its end or purpose. Um, and so to say that God's creation is a failure because in, in, there's so much evil in the universe um, um, would be not looking at the right. The, God, the end is that charity flourish and that it be given all the opportunities to grow uh, as much as as we will to cooperate with him in making it grow and permitting moral evil, first of all, enables it to exist, charity, because it, there wouldn't be a free act of self-giving love if I, we weren't free, and it wouldn't grow if there weren't trials and difficulties, and of trials and difficulties, the greatest by far are not natural disasters, but um, sins of our neighbor. Now, those are the things that hurt by far the most, and provide the, the occasions to for heroic charity. And then we see this above all um, on Calvary. Right? The glory of um, salvation history is Christ on the the glory of, of this universe of any conceivable universe is Christ on the cross. And that um, the beauty of Christ on the cross is precisely the beauty of a sacrificial love that's willing to atone for so much evil. Right? And that the, um, uh, and this is the reason why the church in the Easter Vigil says, oh, happy fault oh, that won for us so great a redeemer. Felix Kupa. Oh, happy fault of Adam, which married us so, so, such a savior. And so we can say that God foresaw the sin of Adam and all the personal sins of all history and willed to permit them also and in some way, especially for this, so that Christ in redeeming them um, would, um, would manifest a charity um, that m communicates who God is that manifests the, the love of God more than anything else could. Yeah. All right, so God permits sin for the sake of a greater good. What are these greater goods? Free will itself, the natural order of things. Um, and then um, it makes possible certain goods that otherwise couldn't exist. And that is precisely the growth in sacrificial love and charity, which is precisely God's purpose in creating the universe, that that flourish as much as possible. Okay. Um, let's take a break here and then questions and answers.